Greetings, cavemen. Rodamon here. Thank you for tuning in to a brand new series playing Primitive Society Simulator. If you would like to skip the game's overview or what to expect out of this series, please use YouTube chapters. So before I start, I'm going to read you a little blurb about the game and also uh, what to expect out of this series. Primitive Society Simulator is a game where you help shape a tribe as they advance from foraging and gathering with flint tools to a thriving proto-nation through discovery, hard work, animal domestication, agriculture, and trade. The game is loaded full of unique and complex game mechanics, allowing for rewarding progress as you build your primitive society. The game isn't out yet. It'll be out in about mm, two weeks, but there is a playable demo. And as per usual, this will air on YouTube. Additionally, what to expect out of this series? There is a tutorial, as you can see in the game, but I'm not going to be playing it. You step through, um, I think it's six, five or six, five different tutorials explaining the individual game mechanics. Uh, but I would rather start a new tribe and then just explain as I go, doing the best that I can. But it will be a hybrid Let's Play and tutorial. And as per usual, again, I will incorporate uh, audience feedback and raffling off characters. The starting characters, however, have already been raffled to my Patreon patrons, and I'll be playing on normal difficulty. So let's start a new tribe. As you can see, there are a bunch of different uh, difficulty levels, and then you can also use the bars to change them however you want. So if you don't like sickness or you don't like manhunters, you know, you can change those types of things. But I'm going to keep it on normal. So here is all of the options. Gives you a lot of options. The starting characters. So unlike um, many games that are out there, uh, the starting characters here are going to have initial intelligence and vitality, but no skills, as you can see. Everyone is skillless. And if you're wondering, the, um, the starting intelligence and vitality is not that important. It's not a it's not a number that can't be changed quickly through uh, meeting nutritional needs and things like that. And all of these starting characters have already been raffled, so I'm going to start to name them uh, as quickly as I can. So we're going to have Zeusin. Uh, actually, I'm going to do first names. So Zeusin and the last name will be Ibright. We've got Lisk, and I'm just going to have this be Lisk, Lisk. We've got Dwarvenation, again Dwarvenation, Dwarvenation. And the last male in the tribe is, uh, let's call you Tanuki. And your last name will be Toxic. And then down to the females. So if you're wondering, uh, everybody is paired up at the start. And I think it's like the top male with the top female. If I'm wrong, it's going to get a little confusing. But uh, that's what I'm going to try to do. I believe you can rename characters once you're in. But we'll see. So you're going to be Rage Ride, right? And you're going to be... Something Lisk, uh, Maddox Lisk. Then we have Dwarvenation, Cathanon. And last but not least, Jazz Lover, Toxic. All right. And yeah, all the stats are, are zero. And you level up your stats uh, in a whole bunch of ways, and we'll start explaining that soon. So let's get to it. Is Yoda a puppy? He is uh, 11. So no, he is just a small breed, but definitely not a puppy. He's an old man. A new home. The hillside we once called home was swallowed up by a sudden blizzard. Everything perished. 
Compelled by our fate, we set out on a long journey to find a new home. Rivers flowed towards the sun as the land stretched out towards the sky as far as our eyes could see. The wilderness broadened before us. In the end, we found our safe place, a land rich with life. We will continue to accept nature's blessing and tribulations. Our people will survive. So right at the start here, we have a stockpile with some basic tools um, that is also tracked up here. So we start off with some wood, stone, grass, flint, branches, and animal hide, as well as picks, blades, axes, rope, and spears. There's also potions, which are healing items used when you're sick, and then some meat and berries. Uh, looking around the map tile, we start off the first of spring. There's 10 days per season, 40 days per year. And you can also see the ambient temperature up here in Celsius. Uh, there is wealth and prestige. Prestige is awarded to you when you complete missions and milestones, which I'll get into in a minute. And then also population. Our population is eight. Uh, down here, you can see the tracked uh, colonists. And then up here is what you're currently working on or a sort of alerts and warnings. So it's warning me that people are sleeping on the ground. So that is something to be fixed soon. Sleeping on the ground and sleeping without a shelter makes you more vulnerable to the ambient temperature. Um, the build tab. So here is all of the buildings that you start off with. And there's also sub menus. So structures would only be sheds and floors, furniture only beds, prestige would be a war totem, plants, a seed table, Medicare. And I'll get into what each and every one of these does as I use them. The assign work tab should be pretty familiar with anyone familiar with um, RimWorld or Going Medieval. Um, the difference is you can sort by skill. So if you hit these arrows here, it will sort by, um, by whoever is most skilled at the top. So that's really useful in a lot of ways. And then you can also drag these as well. So you can, um, you can click on the tags here if you want to change. So for instance, if you have a bunch of things that need to get hauled to a stockpile, you can just double click these storing resources and raise the priority. Um, there is also individual sub uh, options here as well. So like there's different types of butchery, there's different types of like animals. So once you have, um, let's say chickens and sheep, you can prioritize chickens over sheep or sheep over chickens. So there's a, a lot of granularity that the game allows. There's also clear copy and paste. Um, for food management, um, the one way to raise your vitality and intelligence stats, so vitality is better for like hunting and combat and intelligence is for um, invention and discovery is depending on what you eat. Um, right now, we just have raw meat, which is uh, 0.8 vitality and 0 0.5 uh, five in intelligence. And then berries, which is 0 0.05, 0 0.05. Um, later on, when you're able to actually do cooking, there are uh, foods that are better for one or the other. So if you want um, someone to focus on intelligence or vitality, this is useful. And then eating food ingredients uh, would be something that you could do if you were uh, a little bit more desperate. Anapals is not domesticated animals, but domesticated animals that have been tamed, like direwolves or boars, which can help you haul and fight. Get that into the later. Quests is a very major mechanic in this game, which allows you to progress through technology. Um, there is these uh, sort of overarching quests that uh, we'll get into once they uh, are offered. But then we will periodically have quests to trade with neighbors, and that will pop up here. Ancestral Will is milestones for your community, which will raise your prestige. So as you can see, if we catch a thousand fish and then craft a harpoon, and then build a lobster trap, fishing net, and fishing pond, we'll gain prestige. And prestige is sort of your wealth, uh, which is a currency that you can use for like forming alliances and the like. So there's a whole bunch of these sort of ancestral will, which are like major milestones that you've achieved for your uh, tribe. 
Creations is the tech tree. So this one is really interesting. Uh, the tech tree is very different in this game than others. Um, so for instance, if you mouse over this, you can see if we craft tools, depending on the type of tool, we gain a little bit of um, insight into crafting works. And that's how everything kind of works, is like the more you interact, the more you craft like clothing and tools, the more you will discover about advanced crafting tools. Um, one thing I will say is that doing quests will raise your technology, your creations, leaps and bounds. So if you want to really push the tech tree, fulfilling quests is very important. And as you can see, there's a lot of stuff in this tech tree and some of it is very significant. So for instance, as we start, we can only really build sheds and simple dirt floors. Um, but here is soil piling where we're able to build walls. So the game will take a very long time to progress through this tech tree, but the technology is very significant. So right now, we are really only hunters and gatherers. We really start off with like no agriculture whatsoever, um, where we barely can survive. And then through technology and discovery, we get the ability to domesticate and cook and um, create cheese and create better weapons and tools and structures. And the game will go from living in tents, huddled around a fire to like a hell of an empire. It's actually a really cool progression tree. Uh, one of the things to note is that the world is also three dimensional, uh, very much like going medieval. Uh, so there's uh, those considerations to be made initially as well. Uh, as you start, without the technology to build ramps or walls or anything, you're very much on flat ground with no defensive advantage over invaders. But as you gain technology, you can build watchtowers and walls and gates and things like that. So that's the tech train. We'll get into that in a little bit. And then the last two tabs down here is search for herbs. Uh, so searching for herbs takes food from your encampment and deploys someone to go wander the world to find um, herbs to be made into potion and then also unknown herbs and unknown crops to advance their foraging and herbs knowledge. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later, but that's uh, a really good way to build up your medical supplies. And then the last one is the world map. So this is what the world looks like. And we all have um, a bunch of different types of neighbors around us. And depending on the tribe type, they will have different things sold. So for instance, um, Sand Swamp is a farming tribe. So they have, you know, some calves for sale, for instance. And there's also hostile tribes as well. And you can form alliances. There will also be event tabs and tiles here. So uh, for instance, if we level up to be able to unlock direwolf domestication, there will also be direwolves spotted, which we can travel to and hunt the adults and capture the juveniles for training. So that is sort of the long and short of it. Um, up here, this is just sort of the supplies and then show and hide wall. I doubt we'll even get to wall technology in this stream uh, as it is somewhat slow to develop. Uh, hide and show trees, hide and show roofs and, uh, and rooms and then ceremonial areas. So the first order of business is to solve the people sleeping on the ground. And there's a bunch of different ways to do it, but ultimately people want beds. Now what I would like to do is to figure out who I want doing certain work. Uh, there is a little bit of consideration to be made here because uh, you have males and females and females get pregnant. And that's a significant part of the game. So if we take a look at like Zeusin, for instance, and look at relationship. Oh, Zeusin, I guess no one starts off with a relationship. But um, what will end up ultimately happening is that uh, people will form relationships with one another and get pregnant. And when you're pregnant, um, the females won't be able to search the world map for herbs or, or go do combat or hunt, things like that. So um, when you are assigning work, it's useful to remember that certain work types are disabled during different trimesters of pregnancy. So first trimester, you're not allowed to let leave the tribe grounds. And then the next trimester, it's going to restrict um, 
like crafting and building and so, so on and so forth. So when you're assigning work types, it's just important to keep that in mind because you don't want your like primary hunter to be female and then uh, them be, being pregnant and then not being able to actually hunt. Uh, and you can allow or disallow pregnancy here with this checkbox. So just because you're female doesn't mean you need to have a child. So let's go ahead and build our beds. I'm not really sure how our people are gonna pair off, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna build the beds. I'm gonna treat this center stockpile as somewhat of the heart of the tribe, and then to have like outbuildings uh, to try to look somewhat more role-playing style than uh, usual. What I would like to have is to have um, people with the different employment options living near where they're working. So for instance, if we have a cook, having the cook live near the kitchen. That kind of idea. So we'll get those built. And then I'm also gonna pop a shed over them um, to protect the tiny little initial tents from the elements. So I think I just did a four by four over these little beds. And we'll get that built. Um, so speaking about work priorities, uh, I would like to already somewhat assign them. So I'm going to have uh, Danuki Toxic be our like medical care herbs person, uh, which means that I want them to prioritize the medical care, managing dead, soothing, and herbalism. Um, Soothing is like uh, after combat, people are going to be upset. So it's a way to normalize their moods. And then raise gathering resources. And then also um, foraging. So that's the first one that I'm going to sort of make the decision to go. This person's going to specialize. And then I'm going to take... So gathering resources is... is um, actually, no, they don't need to be gathering resources. Foraging, wild crops, and select seeds. Yeah. So, what I want to do is copy and paste the work priorities so nobody else does that type of work yet. It would be useful to have someone else do medical care, besides the one person in case they get sick, but you can self-tend pretty easily. Now, your people will automatically gather resources that you are uh, that are around. So you don't necessarily need to order them to do specific tasks like collecting rocks and flint or cutting down trees because they will sort of self-assign that. Although you can, if you decide, like, hey, this tree's in the way, I can cut it down. Uh, so it is useful if, for instance, you're running out of food to like zoom out, double click all the berry bushes and just say, hey, forge these berry bushes. Keeping in mind that berries spoil rather quickly. So the current priority now is set up sleeping areas. And then after we get the set up sleeping areas, um, I'm also going to um, cover the initial stockpile with, um, with a roof, which will keep things from spoiling so quickly. Is there a Z-axis? Yeah. Yeah, and you can see that in the hills and mountains adjacent to us. So if we mouse over like the berries here, these will spoil after five days because they're losing 20 freshness per day because they're outside with no roof or shed and also laying on the ground. And as we um, construct this stuff, that will be solved. So here's what it looks like now where we have four tiny little sort of TP lean-to looking things. Um, and then the center stockpile. All right. Another thing that is important is to get a bonfire. So a bonfire is sort of the shared meal space that your people use. 
Um, I'm actually going to demolish this and expand this a little bit. Well, let's put a bonfire in here with bonfire seats for everybody. Four on each side. And then this is going to expand down so it's a little bit more symmetrical so that our stockpile is larger and uh, and things are, are not laying on the ground. So these rocks are in the way and I'll harvest those rocks so that they're uh, removed. The other thing we could do is to put uh, floors underneath our tents just to make it a little bit nicer. It does raise um, colony value, but that's not going to be too much of a problem on normal difficulty. So the bonfires, the share, shared meal space where people will eat and um, and share uh, sort of creations and intelligence at night. Uh, you'll see it in process uh, when we hit nighttime. So now I have everyone adding floors. The next thing I'm going to want to do is to construct a crafting center. Um, to be able to get a weaver's table and a, a crafting table. Crafting tables are going to allow you to make tools and weaver's table is going to allow you to make clothing. And if you take a look at the statuses of everyone, they're sleeping on the ground and wearing no clothes. And that's upsetting to them. So that's something that is easy to solve. But now you can see that um, that these grass sheds here are um, are uh, somewhat nicer with the flooring, more enjoyable to sleep in. And you do eventually get uh, much. You get actually um, building construction much much later on. Wood structures and stone structures and things like that. So a crafting table um, is going to be most ideal to have it really close to the stockpile so that there's not a, a distant run to go for it. And then on the other side, maybe on this side, I will do a weaver's table to have it that close to the center stockpile as possible. And those uh, structures are going to want uh, roofs over them as well. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to build oversized roofs over them, knowing that I'm going to be adding to those um, those individual areas. So let's uh, let's pick a crafter. Uh, I'm going to have Madoc be our crafter and you know what I might do is I might um, I wonder if the game allows me to remove last names I'm just going to have their last names be default for now until they pair up so everyone's going to have like essentially no last name because then it will be a lot more um, straightforward who I'm talking about I wasn't sure whether or not they came with um, uh, paired up or not, but I guess they don't. But I only have uh, I have only have four double beds, so they're gonna have to pair up quick. So in terms of crafting, um, crafting is so if you take a look at the skills here, you have got crafting, and crafting is crafting and building. You've got fishing, animal husbandry, food preparation, gathering resources. Um, hunting, forging, and herbs. So uh, I'm going to assign, let's say, Madoc to be our primary crafter builder. Now crafting is one of those things that you'll need to do a lot of because there's a lot of tools and a lot of construction needed. Um, so it can be helpful to have like a secondary crafter. But for now, I'm just going to have one primary crafter. 
uh, because it is very useful to have high skilled and specialized people. A bunch of generalists aren't uh, effective, in other words. And updating the priority of craft tools and clothing. So we take a look here, and this is what we can initially craft. We have flint axes, which is uh, useful for cutting down trees, flint blades for grasses, picks for mining rocks, and spears for combat. And um, as I mentioned, I want uh, like an oversized, ooh, it's not very symmetrical. I could always fix that. I want an oversized tent over here because I'm going to be adding to the crafting room. Um, so I'll do a very large tent to accommodate for the extra space. So we have this warning of like buildings without roofs and the buildings without roofs is just, you know, because people don't want to work in the open air. Oh, I have a wrong stream tags on, don't I? Okay, I kind of fixed that. I might not show up until you refresh. So, uh, our crafters. I would say the best way to do this is to maintain a certain minimum. And it's a little overkill to have one tool per person, but because it's just made of like sticks and flint, those are pretty readily available materials. So that's what I like to do is just make one per person. So it's a lot of crafting work, but once we have it, uh, we'll be good. And then for rope, let's just craft until we have five. Rope is useful to later on to make weapons like slings or bows, and it's also useful to um, to rope animals for animal domestication. And here we go. Here is the shared meal, uh, sort of at the end of the day, where everybody comes and consumes food, and the food that they consume will add to their intelligence and vitality, depending on what they're eating and it's also a place where they will share ideas so when we have new inventions um they will talk about the new inventions before inventing it and that will um that process uh will make more sense once we get there but here as you can see people are leveling up from food preparation and from eating uh specific things And I'm gonna set up the making clothing as well. So we'll need a bone needle in order to start crafting clothing and bone needles are gonna be acquired from making them out of bone, which requires us to do some hunting. We do start off with uh, two flint spears. So I just need to equip a flint spear on um, someone for them to go hunt. So let's uh, pick a hunter. And here you can see people pairing up now. That doesn't necessarily mean they're in a relationship yet, but um, it's once they are, I will uh, give them a shared last name. Maybe I'll raffle it off to you guys. So it'll be like, you know, Rager and then whoever gets raffled. So Lisk, I'm gonna have you be the hunter. So hunting is beast hunting, uh, capturing juveniles, butchering meat and hunting. And uh, actually it's probably easier if I remove the priority for everyone else, but there we go. So now Lisk, and let's also do Zuzin. It's useful to have two hunters. Hunting solo can be a little dangerous. Lisk and Zuzin will both be our hunters. There is time controls up here. So right now I'm playing at 1x speed, and you can hit uh, 1 and 2 as the binds. You can go up to 8x speed. So like during the night, I usually ramp it up because there's not much happening at night. And once people are out, I can uh, put it back down.
Okay, we are now crafting tools. Uh, Rager is doing it? Is that correct? No, but... So I'm gonna lower the priority for everybody so that uh, Maddock is the one specializing in that. And if you ever wanna cancel what they're currently working on, you can click on the person and do cancel assign, which will tell them to stop doing whatever they were doing. So then if I want Maddock to be crafting, I can just cancel the collection of grass and they will uh, immediately prioritize the next best thing. So I did mention that um, Zeusin and Lisk should get weapons. So one easy way to do that, and actually they already have weapons. They self-assign them. Uh, they're already hunting. As you can see, they chose to hunt the chickens that I lived near. So that works for me. Now you can um, uh, domesticate chickens, which I will do uh, once we have some initial bone and, and clothing. What's the expected price? I don't know that. So let's go ahead and um, and do animal domestication. Why not? So in order to do that, we'll need a uh, a chicken bed. But maybe. Hmm. I don't know if I want to fix the tent location. Nah, I'll probably leave it. Make it look more organic, kind of on purpose. So, um, I think what I'll do is eventually have an area here for cooking, meaning that I will put um, sort of the chicken pens down this way, or the animal pens. And I'm going to have them rather small because they get a little labor intensive to micromanage. So I don't want to domesticate too many animals at once. Keep the numbers limited for my sanity. So over here, you've got um, Kath and Tanuki uh, just fishing the fish that are in the open stream. Let's see if they've paired up yet. Nah, not yet. Rager and Dormination are trying to get rid of the, um, the, the stone ores. Badok is crafting our tools. And you'll also see that their skill levels up. So it's out of a thousand, which is quite a lot. But, um, but when you have children, you can mentor children to be specialized, which is a good way to get a jump start. Let's see what else others are working on. So we're probably doing a fair bit of hunting here too. I guess it wouldn't hurt to get uh, floors in the crafting sheds too, just for the aesthetics. Does water have a flowing mechanic? Uh, yeah, it. Um, I actually haven't tried to dig out water, but I think you can uh, once you get uh, dirt piling uh, tech. But it also freezes in the winter, except for a few holes for ice fishing. Um, so water will, water is a terrain blocker outside of winter. And then there are certain sections of the river like this, which are more shallow, which will have lobster, uh, lobster holes, and you can set up lobster traps eventually. So outside of winter, you can rely on the water blocking raiders from passing, except for these shallow parts, because the deep water is impassable. But um, that doesn't remain true in the winter. Here is our campfire. I wonder if anyone has paired up yet. Oh, there we go. Uh, natural endowment hunting has been accomplished. So I have hunted 20 animals with our hunters. And the next uh, achievable will here is to catch 
a direwolf juvenile and tame them and then have them become an adult from a juvenile and then assign them to a person as a pet, as a hunting companion. And they're very effective. Uh, think like Rimworld Warg. They're, they're, they're pretty powerful. Dead Dodo and Lokiwa, uh, thank you for the, uh, the resubs. And um, Crimson Rust, thank you for gifting out all the subs. Cheers. So in our tools, you can see over here that we are um, getting a lot of flint axes. I think what I'll do is I will change the work priority just so that we get blades and pickaxes and then eventually go back. So you can hit this arrow here to move it to the top of the queue. So I, now I'm going to be next working on pickaxes instead of uh, instead of uh, more axes because we don't need to cut down too many trees. We don't really have a lot of use for wood because uh, we don't know how to build wood structures. And here you can see Zeusin hunting sheep. We don't know how to domesticate sheep yet, but sheep are a great resource for um, leathers, which is going to allow us to make clothing. And Maddox here is already starting to tailor up um, clothing. So we're making the bone needles and we have the bone needles now. Now we can make winter clothing. And the rocks that are blocking the uh, roof over our storage, one of the two is gone. Yeah, the tech tree, there's a lot. So in the in the blurb that I have about the game, that I say that it has a lot of unique and complex game mechanics, that's me speaking from limited, but my own personal experiences. That there's a ton of things about this game which are very dissimilar from games in its genre. Um, the fastest way, for instance, for you to gain more technology is to exchange knowledge with uh, neighbors, which I've never seen a game like that before. And there's a lot of other, there's a mentorship of children. There is a elders passing their knowledge down generation, genera uh, generationally. There's a lot of mechanics like that that are, um, that are pretty novel and, and not found, um, you know, in uh, in most other games. Uh, so another thing that we're going to build as part of this sort of general stockpile is uh, f uh, meat dryers. Uh, meat dryers will allow you to dry out your meat. And there's also a fruit dryer. Um, but dry out your meat so it doesn't spoil. And I'll do a fruit dryer here as well. And that will keep the meat and the fruit fresh so that we don't have to constantly hunt and forage for berries. And Maddox almost finished the first um, clothing. So in their statuses, they have um, their own personal feelings, like had food to eat, slept by a bonfire, sleeping under a shed, um, their health recovery because they are being treated well. And then their family and their mentorship. Whether they can apprentice under someone else or mentor children. Um, their equipment, so clothing, raincoats, main tool, sub tool, weapon, armor. And then what kind of food they eat, their stats, everything. There's a lot of granular detail. So yeah, generations are involved and people will either die from combat or from old age. That's something that does happen. Um, generations are slow though. The amount of time it takes. So the, I'll, I'll put it this way. So far we've had, um, we're on day four. And for Lisk, for instance, to enter elder old age is gonna be in 
uh, roughly eight years, which is um, 320 days. So it's, um, and, they're, and they're 243 days old already. The, the game, so generations take a very long time. Uh, I would say like, depending on the speed of play, you know, you're gonna have a, a single individual live for like 10 to 20 in-game hours, depending on the, again, the, the speed of the clock. So it's not that the people in your community will come and go quickly. You can really invest in them, train them, mentor them, gear them up, give them skills, all that stuff. So here Manic is wearing um, winter clothing. Winter clothing will decay over time. So after four years or three years rather, um, they'll need a new piece of clothing and it changes their tolerable temperature. So here, as you can see, the temperature that Maddox has is um, negative eight Celsius. Whereas like uh, for uh, Dorvanation is negative two. Yeah, the, the game doesn't have, uh, the characters don't like age up like normal humans. Um, so it does tell you, for instance, that they can become pregnant after seven years and they they die uh, at like age 25 or something like that. So it's compressed a little bit um, for game mechanic reasons, which is the same to be said for like, you know, every game does a little bit differently, but like RimWorld, your children age up at like 400% speed or whatever. And you can see Maddox rolling out the clothing for people to wear. Thank you for tuning in to Primitive Society Simulator, which originally streamed live on Twitch, February 13th. If you have any feedback or questions for me, let me know in the comments below. If you would like to catch a live stream of mine, Rodamont.com has my stream schedule and countdown timers to upcoming streams. If you would like to join my gaming community on Discord, Rodamont.com has a link to it, as does the description of this video. Thank you so very much for watching, and a special thank you to my Patreon patrons, Twitch subscribers, and viewers like you that support the channel, and then all the way to the credits. Thank you so very much. Hope to catch you next episode or an upcoming stream. Farewell, my fellow cavemen.